So now we're moving on to the, the wildlife gardening principles. So these are the main principles of what you should operate on. So the first one is plant local needs. And what I mean by that is plant, pretty much just walk to your, the nearest bush reserve, look at what plant species are there, and that's usually the best indicator of what you should incorporate into your backyard, unless you're going for a particular animal species. But also local, that's important as well. So that just means getting the genetic stock of what's in your area. Because you can have one plant species which is distributed along the whole east coast of Australia. <coughs> but plant the, in the same plant species, if you look at one individual from the north and one individual to the south, they'll have very different genetics. So it's important to get the local natives and you can source the local, uh, the local um, strands of these plants at the local council nursery or if there's any other local nurseries about. So it's best to source it from them rather than sourcing it from like online, you'll probably get genetic stock from Canberra or some other far away place which doesn't really represent what's growing here. The second principle is targeting, targeted gardening. So that, that kind of is different to the first point. That's, that's actually planting whatever particular animal species you have in mind, planting and structuring your garden towards that animal species. So we'll get into that. We'll go into that in quite a lot of detail. But yeah, just figuring out what, what the specific animal you want to attract and figuring out every little nuance of what it likes in its habitat structure. The third, and the third um, principle is variety is key, and that's the most important one, especially if you want to attract a wide variety of different animal species. So both in terms of variety of species, which means variety of plant species. So the more plant species, different plant species you can get in your backyard, it pretty much determines how many different animals can live in your backyard. And variety in terms of structures. And that just means the different vegetation structures, so canopy, shrub, ground cover, grassland, and also variety in terms of biotic structures such as ponds, rock outcrop, rocks, um, logs, and stuff like that. So I'm going to expand on those two last ones since they're, they're definitely the most important ones. <coughs> so variety of species. So what I, what I mean by this is when you put more plants in there, what, what happens is that you'll get a more diversity and abundance of different insect species. And this is because in Australia, or in every country, um, every plant species will usually have multiple different insect species that solely rely on that plant species for food or for habitat, or maybe for their larval food. And so if you put as many different plant species as possible, you'll get you'll attract as many different of these insect and vertebrate species as possible. And the significance of this is because this essentially starts the first order of consumers. So that's the small skinks, small frogs, small insectivorous birds. They all eat the in, they all eat these insects. <coughs> And it, the interesting thing is that we actually don't know much about these small animals' diets. So we, it's a bit of a precautionary principle by putting in as much plants as possible because we don't know if they target, like if, if, for example, the weasel skink, we don't know if they target a particular invertebrate group. So if you incorporate all plant, all, a lot of different plants to get as many different invertebrate groups in there as possible, you'll fill in those blanks that we currently don't know and be able to <coughs> get a lot of different 
um, small animal species in there as possible. And then once you've got them, then that's when you can start attracting the bigger things. So for example, if you put a few gum trees, you've got a few gum trees in your backyard, you'll have possums there. And then the possums will then provide food for the powerful owl. So you've got that flow on effect. If you've got these small frogs and lizards, you might get uh, the southern booble, which is another small owl species. Sorry, the first one's not small, but that, that one's small. Um, you'll, you'll provide food for them. And then other larger species of lizards, such as eastern water dragons, they'll eat smaller species of lizards. So that will provide food for them. So it's just, and you, you start this whole trophic cascade through planting as many different plant species as possible. And just to illustrate this point further, this, this is when I really learned about <clears throat> how this all worked. Um, it was when I was working at a bush reserve. Um, it's Sartor Bush Reserve in Liverpool. And in this bush reserve, I mean, it's pretty small. It's probably, probably not even half a football field big. And it's, it's in Liverpool, so it's surrounded by urbanisation. <coughs> it does have a bit of connectivity, because it, it's next to Orphan School Creek, which but even that creek is really degraded. So I actually didn't have much hopes for this bush reserve, but my friend, my uh, old work colleague, informed me that it has an incredible amount of plant um, diversity, native plant diversity. So I, I joined in with him to try and protect it. And this project's still ongoing, actually. We've made it look very good. But yeah, you can't see with the resolution here, but there's a lot of different native plant species in here. And what I started noticing after the first few days of working on this project was the amount of insect species here that I had never seen before anywhere else in Sydney. So you started getting the large, large butterfly species like that one. And there's a gra we had grass skippers. I actually haven't seen grass skippers prior to this occasion. So there's a, and there's a hoverfly, and I caught one in the act of feeding off one of the native plants here which was very obvious and poignant. And yeah, then we had the six-spotted leaf beetle, which is the first time I'd seen this species as well. And yeah, so just a huge amount of insect diversity. And that, that was solely attributed to the amount of native plant species that were in this small bush reserve. Uh, at the moment, the tally for the amount of native plant species in this, in this bush reserve is about 140. Wow. So, yeah, it's really incredible. So now we're going to talk in terms of variety of structures. So, first, the canopy. Um, now that's important for all the arboreal stuff, but we'll, we'll break all these down in um, specific into specific, so I can go into about what animals are attracted to each. But yeah, so you have all your general stuff. <coughs> if you have, if you incorporate all these layers, you can attract a much greater diversity of different animals. And just to illustrate this, you don't have to think too complexly about this. This is just a little garden bed at the front of my house. And um, you look at this and it's, <coughs> it's not, not that appealing really to wildlife, you'd think. But there is some small little habitat structures in there which enables some reptiles to exist that you wouldn't otherwise think about. So the obvious one is along this pavement it gets a bit of sunlight and that provides perfect basking opportunities for the common garden skink. So I'm sure a lot of people or most of you will have these skinks in your backyard. <clears throat> and most of them will just be on the pavement. So just having pavement will provide them the right structure to be in your backyard. Then another one which I actually only discovered earlier this year, I um, came home from work when I was doing uh, reptile surveys, and pretty much reptile surveys just involves lifting up rocks constantly. So I came home and I saw a rock and I lifted it up because I was in the groove. And I ended up finding a uh, reptile I hadn't seen since I was 10 in 
in my backyard. And this is a three-toed um, worm skink. And yeah, so just having that rock with a nice, a lot of mulch and leaf litter underneath the rock, that provided the habitat structure to enable this species to exist here as well. And then the other one is on that vertical brick wall, which gets a bit of sunlight, I also have another species skink there, which is the, the wall or the fence skink. And um, so yeah, just these little structures enable these species to exist here.